Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we are um, happy to present a forum on um, anti-vaping. Uh, we heard from you, um, especially here at the high school, the parents during the parent forum, um, how widespread the vaping uh, concern is, and here at the high school as well. And so we listen to you. Um, we have a district-wide committee that's been meeting. We've learned so much from all of our um, agency partners, and we are now here to be able to give you information um, that, that may help uh, you with uh, your children or your children's friends. And we'll hear more about that. So we have um, two guest speakers tonight. Um, our first guest speaker will be uh, Marissa uh, Vidal. She's from the Southeast Tobacco Free Community Partnership. And we have Dr. Spillane. He's a thoracic surgeon with uh, thoracic surgery. And uh, both of them will be presenting uh, a little bit different, um, but it, this can be informal. You can certainly ask questions uh, as we go along, or there will be time for question and answers at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the experts. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa Vidal. I am the program manager of the Southeast Tobacco Free Community Partnership, um, funded through the Massachusetts Tobacco Cessation and Prevention Program. And basically, we are going to talk about vaping. Um, we're going to go through some statistics, some data, um, and I'm going to explain to you really what vaping is, how it works. Um, I have some products that you can actually come up and see at the end. I sometimes pass them around, but just the way that the setup is tonight, it'll be easier if at the end if you want to see and actually see the products um, in person, you can just come up after the fact. And I'm also going to talk about some of the tactics that the industry, the vaping and tobacco industry use to intentionally target kids. But we're going to start with some data. This graph is showing you youth use of, of vape in e-cigarette products in Massachusetts. In 2017, so this is a little old, but in 2017, about 40% of Massachusetts high schoolers reported currently, uh, I'm sorry, reported ever using e-cigarettes, and about 20% were currently using. If you compare that to the youth use rates of combustible cigarettes, you'll see that the numbers for vaping are much higher. Only about 6.5% of high schoolers are, are smoking combustible cigarettes, and that's largely um, due to the fact that high schoolers and young people really, really know the negative health effects of combustible cigarettes. The education's been done, you know, kids understand that. What they don't understand and what they didn't understand when e-cigarettes first came on the market was that e-cigarettes do contain nicotine. They do contain these other harmful substances that we're gonna talk about. And the result is that we have really high rates right now of high schoolers and middle schoolers even who are using these addictive products and who are addicted to nicotine through the use of these products. This is the middle school data. Uh, about 10% of Massachusetts middle schoolers have ever used e-cigarettes in 2017. And this is a graph that's showing current use of tobacco products. You'll see the green, um, sorry, the purple, 23.7% up, um, up at the top. That's the e-cigarette line. So we did see a slight decrease from 2015 to 2017, um, and we'll see where, you know, where we are now in 2019 once we get that data. But you know, what we know right now is that this, the vaping epidemic that we're dealing with, it's, it's a unique issue here. It's, it's different from combustible cigarettes. It's not the same thing. So what exactly is vaping? Um, the, the picture up here on the screen that's, that's going along with this slide is just showing you one of many, many different types of e-cigarettes. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the different brands, but basically the basic way that they work is always pretty much the same. Um, vaping is inhaling and then exhaling the vapor, which is actually an aerosol, produced by heating up and aerosolizing flavored liquid nicotine by one of these devices. There are lots of different names. Um, an e-cigarette is a vape. A jewel is a vape. Um, a lot of times 
kids refer to these by the brand name, so Jewel or Blue or Soren, um, and that's really important to, to, to keep in mind when talking and thinking about e-cigarettes, that they're not always called e-cigarettes and they don't always look like what you might stereotypically think of as an e-cigarette, like maybe one of these devices on the screen. This picture is just showing you, again, the sort of basic way that all of these devices work. The battery, the atomizer, the cartridge area, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but that's where the e-liquid would go. Um, in some devices, the user of the device would fill that e-liquid area themselves, and then in some devices, those cartridge areas are actually pre-filled, and the, the cartridges are sold pre-filled, and once they're used up, you would just replace it with an, another pre-filled cartridge. This picture just showing you some other varieties, um, just a small sampling really of the, the wide variety of these devices. And this is a picture actually of some of the e-liquids. So you'll see the pods and then the freestanding e-liquids that you would add to the device yourself. There are over 10,000 flavors of e-liquid. Anything you can imagine really, bubblegum, cotton candy, mint, um, berry, really anything, popcorn, it's, it's over 10,000 different flavors. Um, this picture is showing you a, a really important point with the flavors. So the flavors in the e-liquids, they're not regulated right now, so the packaging and the labeling can say one thing and then say something totally contradictory right on the same bottle. This one is showing you um, the very top arrow. It says this product does not contain nicotine. And then at the bottom, the last ingredient is nicotine. So sometimes you'll see right on the same bottle that contradiction, but other times um, a bottle could be labeled saying that it contains no nicotine and actually contain nicotine without even listing it. Um, and then other times the bottle can be labeled or the package or whatever could be labeled as containing XYZ amount of nicotine and that, that isn't necessarily accurate because it's not regulated. Um, so that's a really important thing to keep in mind. I, I'm guessing that some of you have probably heard someone say that they're vaping no nicotine, um, or, or you've heard that concept that it's just flavored water or it's just um, you know flavored liquid with no nicotine. Um, and that's not the case. Almost all e-liquids do contain nicotine. This product is showing, uh, this, this slide is showing you just some other types of products. When e-cigarettes first came on the market, they mostly looked like this disposable e-cigarette picture, sometimes even the same colorings as a combustible cigarette. Um, they were, at the beginning and to this day still, uh, marketed as a quit smoking tool. And despite the fact that, the, that a lot of companies will say that they're a tool to quit smoking, they're not FDA regulated cessation tools such as um, the patch or the lozenge, those are FDA regulated cessation tools, but e-cigarettes are not. Again, just another picture of some of the different types. The dark gray device on the screen, that's a jewel. I have jewels that um, we can show you afterwards, but I wanna specifically talk about the jewel because that's really, really, the most popular pretty much in, in high schools and middle schools and among young people right now. This picture is actually showing you the dual charging plugged into a laptop. So you can see it looks a lot like a flash drive. It's, it's very small, it can fit right in the palm of your hand um, and it charges with a USB charger. Very discreet, very easy to go undetected. The, the pods are also on this screen. They have the blue and the orange and the yellow tops. Um, and they're very small. They're, you know, an inch, an inch and a half. They're very, very small. And they come preloaded, pre-filled pre with the nicotine. One pod is about as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. They're sold in a pack of four for about $15. So you're getting four packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine for about $15. This graph is, is showing you the nicotine um, nicotine content in Juul, and this is European Union maximum, but just to show you, you know, what they allow compared to what Juul has. It's very, very high. 
when um, when when e-cigarettes, you know, came came onto the scene, basically, um, a lot of people, and still, but especially when they first came out, a lot of teens didn't know that e-cigarettes contain nicotine. Um, this graph is showing you what teens say is in their e-cigarettes, and the majority are saying it's just flavoring. Really important to see that it's not the case. It's not just flavoring. That's a really, really important myth to dispel here. And then there's also teens reporting that they, you know, they know there's the nicotine or that there's marijuana, or very alarmingly, they don't know what is what is in their e-cigarette. Again, just some more pictures of some other devices. Um, basically, the bottom line here is that e-cigarettes and vapes, they are always evolving. There's always something new. I'm hearing about a new product, you know, every other week. Um, I just heard of a new a new brand that has uh, the, the pods similarly to Juul, but one pod is two packs of cigarettes worth of nicotine. Uh, so it's always something new. And usually they are small, they are techy, they look like um, a tech device. They wouldn't necessarily know what it is at first glance. Um, so really, really important to basically keep up to date and, and stay on top of the new brands. Um, and anything that you don't recognize right away, it's a tech type of device, but you don't know what it is, take a second look at that. Um, do, some, do some Googling, basically, um, if you don't know exactly what it is, because it very well could be an e-cigarette device. So what's exactly in an e-cigarette? <clears throat> so there's, there's nicotine, and we're gonna talk about nicotine in, a, in just a second. But besides the nicotine, in that aerosol that the user of this device is inhaling and exhaling, there are volatile organic compounds such as benzene, there are ultrafine particles, flavorings, including diacetyl, which is linked to a really serious lung disease, um, referred to as popcorn lung. There are heavy metals from the batteries and the heating coils, actually, so nickel, lead, and tin, and other cancer-causing chemicals. And all of this is, is what we know for now. Um, these products are so new that actually we don't have the really long-term public health data on this, and we don't know everything there is to know. But what we know so far is this, um, and we know it's not good. We know that aerosol is inhaled by the user of an e-cigarette, and then it's exhaled. And actually, the exhale, the secondhand vapor, isn't safe either. So it's not just the user of the device who's getting these harmful substances, it's the folks around them who are breathing in that secondhand vape too. Nicotine in particular, we know a lot about. We know that nicotine is especially damaging to the developing brain. We know the brain's not fully developed until about age 25. Using nicotine before the brain is fully developed can actually lead to a permanent lowering of impulse control to um, depression or other mood disorders, to permanent damage to the area of the brain that controls learning, and it can actually prime the brain for future drug addiction. We also know that you can use e-cigarettes are more likely to become traditional combustible cigarette smokers. And we know that the earlier a nicotine addiction starts, the harder it is to ever quit. The tobacco industry knows this too, the vaping industry knows this too, and that is why they specifically target young teenagers with these addictive products. They know that a 13-year-old hooked on nicotine is a, a lifelong, potentially a lifelong customer. They know they can make a real lot of money if they get someone hooked really young. E-cigarettes are not safe. Um, the CDC has said that e-cigarettes um, are not safe for youth, young adults, pregnant women, or adults who do not currently use tobacco products. Um, basically, we need more research to know the really long-term health effects. But like I said, what we know so far is not good. E-cigarettes actually can also cause um, burns. There, there have been a couple of explosions um, because of the lithium batteries. And then nicotine poisoning is also an issue too. So um, acute nicotine exposure can actually be toxic. And there have been um, cases where children or adults have been poisoned from swallowing um, or, or actually having skin reactions to getting this liquid nicotine on their skin. And 
E-cigarettes, the devices themselves, they can be used to vape other substances. So it's easier in a device that's an open system, which is meant to add your own flavors or your own liquid. Um, you can just put in the THC oil or any other liquid. But a closed system, so a system that has pre-filled pods, it's actually really not that difficult to hack the pod, basically. Um, and there are brand uh, compatible pods. So like the Juul, for example, there are companies who are selling Juul compatible pods that are empty, that are meant to fill up with whatever the user of that device would want. So it's, it's really not difficult. So it's not just nicotine here, it's any, anything that can be a liquid, really. Two of the really main ways, basically, that as parents you can you can tell if your if your teen is vaping or if their friends or you know whoever any young person is one an unexplained sweet scent. Like I mentioned, there are over ten thousand flavors of e-liquids, and many of them are sweet, candy flavored, cookie flavored, um, and it's it's and I have one that you can smell, um, but it's a really sweet smell. Um, if you if you get a good whiff of it. So that could be a giveaway. And then the other way is the unfamiliar products. Like I mentioned, a lot of the stuff is, it looks like a tech device, but you're not really sure what it is, and it doesn't look exactly like a flash drive, but it sort of does. Um, that type of scenario, do a little investigating, um, and it, it may turn out to be an e-cigarette. Where are kids getting e-cigarettes? They're getting them online. Um, they're getting them from, from friends or from older, uh, older family members, older friends, or uh, other people that they know. And they're also getting them from retailers. Um, there was a, a survey of about, I think it was of 1,000 um, teenagers asking where they got their jewel pods. And it was, the majority of them said that they were getting them directly from a retailer. Um, so the age to purchase these products in Massachusetts is 21 right now. Um, but despite that, unfortunately, the, the illegal sales do happen. That is one way that kids are getting them. And basically what it comes down to here, you know, the underlying theme in all of this is the tobacco industry, in 2009, it, it became illegal for them to sell flavored cigarettes. So flavored combustible cigarettes. Um, and, and from 2009 right up until now, there have been one after another um, of flavored tobacco products that are not cigarettes. So flavored mini cigars, flavored blunt wraps, and now we're seeing this really big boom of e-cigarettes. And the tactic here is to hook kids young. Um, we know, and the industry knows, that flavors are the number one reason that kids use tobacco products. Um, and they spend a lot of money advertising and targeting these flavored cheap products to kids. This graph is showing you specifically about e-cigarettes, um, that youth use of course rises as e-cigarette advertising also <coughs> rises. And um, you know, that, that's, that's not a surprise. And the industry frankly spends a ton of money advertising to kids. Um, and I'll repeat the tactics again. So the, the industry, the tobacco and vaping industries, they make their products sweet, cheap, and easy to get. Sweet, even the packaging, you can tell that this is sweet flavored. There's white grape mini cigars, there's strawberry banana. This picture's a little outdated because it doesn't have the vaping stuff in here, um, but these are the mini cigars and the blunt wraps that I was talking about. It's mixed in with candy and it blends right in. The e-liquids, of course, they contain these same types of flavors, the strawberry banana, the cotton candy, the fruit punch. Um, and again, flavors are the main reason that, that young people start to use tobacco and nicotine. And it actually makes the vaping or the using a mini cigar or whatever it is, whatever form of that tobacco is, the flavors mask the perception of harm. This picture is showing you some of the flavors. There's the blue slushy the Candy King batch, which I actually have for you to smell. Um, you, you probably are associating this with a specific candy and it smells exactly like that specific candy, you can smell it. Um, and then the popcorn, I mean it looks, even the packaging looks exactly like the food product. The products, um, 
can range from really, really cheap to a little more expensive when, when talking about vaping products. Um, low prices can lead to impulse buys, and we know that youth are very price sensitive. There are often sales or specials. Um, this, these two pictures are showing you um, really, really cheap prices for starter kits. Um, there's the blue starter kit was being sold for one dollar for a while as a sale, um, and you know any high schooler or middle schooler for sure can come up with one dollar. And the easy to get tactic here is really important. So vaping products are pretty much everywhere. Um, they're in places that kids go. Kids go to corner stores. They they'll go into you know the, the corner store or gas station. Um, after sports practice to go buy a Gatorade or candy or gum or they'll go in and put money on the pump while uh, mom or dad is going to pump the gas or they'll run in to get a snack while mom or dad is pumping the gas. Um, kids actually go into corner stores more than adults. I would encourage you all to go into the gas station um, next time you're there and look behind the counter. Look at how much there is and it's colorful and it's flavored. Um, the availability of these products sends the message that it's no big deal to kids. They have this constant um, access to them. They see them and it seems normal. One really important way to combat this actually that towns can individually take is they can actually restrict the sale of flavored tobacco products to adult only stores. So taking all this flavored tobacco and nicotine out of the gas stations and corner stores and putting it in stores where you need an ID and you need to be 21 in order to walk in those doors. And that eliminates a lot of exposure. And you know, reducing youth exposure to these products does reduce youth initiation and youth use. This picture is showing you a screenshot from um, the Truth Initiative, which is a really great website. You can get a lot of really good information um, on, on tobacco and nicotine and vaping from that site. Um, and it's explaining that in 2015, Juul spent more than $1 million to market their product, which again, Juul is the most popular e-cigarette among young people. Um, they paid for campaigns on social media sites that young people use, so Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, um, and they, the ads were associating Juul with um, being cool, having fun, relaxation, freedom, and sex appeal. Marketing clearly targeting to teenagers. You can see in the pictures, these are young people in their ads, right? Um, so what you can do, and I know I'm going through this kind of quick, but I wanna make sure we um, can really get into some of the, the really good information about how this is affecting your, you know, your kids' lungs. So really quickly, I'm gonna go through the what you can do. Um, mainly, knowledge is power here. Knowing what this stuff looks like and knowing what's going on in your community is really, really important. Um, recently, there was a state law that went into effect in Massachusetts raising the minimum legal sales age up to 21. It also banned the sale of tobacco products in pharmacies. Massachusetts is the first state in the country to do that, which is really awesome and really important. Makesmokinghistory.org is a site where you can specifically see for each town in Massachusetts, what the tobacco laws are, what the smoking rate is, what the density of tobacco retailers is, a lot of really great information up there. And then there's a ton of information, like fact sheets, frequently asked questions, lots of pictures at getoutraged.org. The Surgeon General's report is up there, um, lots of really good information, and this is what the site looks like. There's also a toolkit for schools up on that site with a lot of um, free curriculum um, that can be put into health classes, um, and a lot of really good information. Um, you can also partner with me to use local media outlets for you know, sharing this information in the community. Um, they, you can find us on social media. Um, and the Massachusetts Clearinghouse has posters, flyers, handouts, all for free. Um, this week, there's actually going to be a youth campaign launched with youth-specific information. So right now, these frequently asked questions and tips for talking with your kids, those are for an adult audience, um, but there's actually going to be some youth-specific information coming out this week, which is really exciting and will be available up on the Clearinghouse for free. And really the main thing here 
um, it's the education. So it's you all as parents or as educators um, knowing the facts and knowing that this is not harmless water vapor. And then it's in turn dispelling those myths for the young people in your lives. Um, talking to them about nicotine, how it affects their developing brain. Talking to them about diacetyl, about popcorn lung, about, um, all, you know, it's an aerosol. It's not a water vapor. It's an aerosol that they're inhaling. Dispelling the myths, whatever myth um, they, might, they might think, you know, know, know the facts um, and share the facts. Also really important to communicate with kids the, the targeting that's going on here from the industry. No one likes to feel like they're being played or being manipulated. And to be very honest, um, the industry is, they're manipulating kids. They're targeting kids with addictive products. We know, we know um, nicotine is addictive. We know it's one of the most addictive substances out there. Communicating with your kids that the industry wants them to spend money on an addictive product is a really important part of that conversation. Give them all the facts. This is just some of the curriculum um, that are free and can be put into the schools. Um, specifically the Catch My Breath curriculum. Um, it's a four lesson curriculum on e-cigarettes, um, and here's just the contact info for someone who can actually help schools with that. And then another thing that schools can do and participate in is called the 84 Movement. The 84 Movement is across Massachusetts, it's a statewide movement, and it's high schoolers actually who are fighting back against big tobacco. Um, we're actually going to the State House on Wednesday with all of the 84 chapters in Massachusetts for this year. Um, and they're going to talk to their legislators and talk to them about what they're seeing in their schools. The 84 is an awesome group to have in a high school because it's that peer-to-peer -peer education and outreach. Um, kids who, who have the facts can then share the facts um, and sometimes it, it means more coming from a friend or a peer um, in addition to hearing it from a parent and a teacher. There's also some surveillance questions um, up at getoutreach.org, which can be really helpful for schools to sort of know where they're at and what they're dealing with. And then in terms of youth cessation, there are a couple of resources out there. Um, the Truth Initiative recently put out a quit vaping tool for youth. Um, it's, it's a texting app. Um, and I've actually recently gotten some really good feedback from uh, a nurse at a school who part of their protocol is that when kids are caught vaping, they, they uh, in addition to whatever disciplinary action the school has, they actually are helping kids enroll in this um, texting quit to this number and kids are liking it. It's discreet and it's private and they're finding it really helpful. There's also resources at smokefreeteen.gov and there's also the quit line. So it's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, folks just have to be 12 or older to call this quit line, and it's free phone-based counseling sessions. You have to be 18 or older to get the nicotine replacement therapy, but anyone, they'll take a call from anyone over 12. This is my contact info. I'll leave it up for a minute while we switch over, and if we will do questions at the end, or should we do a couple questions now? Or? Okay, if anyone has questions, we can do a couple questions now. Yeah. That was a great presentation, Marissa. Thank you. Thanks. But I'm baffled by the whole thing. Yeah. Because I'm aware that over 100 years ago, we started regulating chemicals to be safe and effective before they're dispensed to people as drugs. And back in the 60s and 50s, we regulated occupational safety and health through the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the working environment, so that people would be safe at work. And even then, in the 80s or so, there was a lot of work done to eliminate some of the chemicals you're talking about here from food products because of the, their nature as carcinogens. They, they had uh, uh, benzene, cyclic, cyclic hydrocarbons. And so the part I'm baffled about is, yes, you know, this is free enterprise. The marketers are evil. But shame on us. Why is this a legal product that's on the shelf? It's clearly, through the labeling, it contains harmful, toxic, 
mutagenic and carcinogenic materials, and they're saying, here, smoke this stuff. Why isn't it illegal? Yeah, I... I, I, I may be able to cover some of that in yeah. my part. Definitely. Um, but I'll just say, um, local level change is the fastest. Um, so town by town, the change and the restricting these products to the adult only stores, that's your, that's your best bet basically for fast change. And then one step up from that is the state level change. And then federal level anything is really, really slow. Um, the FDA had pushed back their regulating of e-cigarettes to 2022. And the commissioner of the FDA just announced that he's resigning. So it's sort of up in the air right now uh, in terms of the federal level. What's going to happen once he resigns and you know who, whoever replaces him, we're not sure. Um, but locally, what can be done in Belmont is restricting the sale of flavored products to adult-only stores. That's, that's an immediate um, and important step. And that's something that would go through the Board of Health. Um, and that's something that I'm happy to, to talk with you about after and we can collaborate on that if you'd like. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Um, what else can we put a reasonable size the Anything that can be a liquid. Any, Any liquid, yes. Anything that can be liquid. What I'm hearing from a lot of schools is that THC is really commonly being vaped as well. Yeah. Right. So the THC oil doesn't necessarily have to smell like dry marijuana wood, and then especially if there is a free flavor mixed in with it as well. Now the THC pods or the nicotine? You mean? THC. Yeah, I mean, I know that they there are specific vape devices that are specifically meant to vape THC. I'm not sure what specifically, like what specific products are selling or what specific pods, um, but yes, there are THC pods. Over. <laughs> Thank you. So give me just a sec, but um, I, I've had the uh, pleasure of working with Marissa now for a few talks, and uh, she's really doing a great job with things. This is an epidemic, so back to your question, the problem is it's an epidemic. And like most epidemics, you're not aware of the size and the scope of the problem until you're already in it. And, and that, that's the central problem. Uh, this, this didn't exist uh, five years ago. We weren't seeing this five years ago, um, three years ago. And uh, much to Dr. Doerr's credit, uh, Falmouth is being very proactive on that, on this topic. This is not a Falmouth high school issue. This is not a Falmouth school issue. This is not a Cape Cod issue. This is not a Massachusetts issue. It's, it's not even a national issue. This is an international issue. So there is this confluence, just kind of to get back to your thing. We're specifically talking about tobacco products tonight, but yes, THC, uh, you can hack the jewel pod and refill it. Uh, that I know of, uh, THC is not sold in there, but I haven't been to where yet, yeah, or the big lines. Uh, but, you know, the, the THC oils don't necessarily have that. The more nefarious stuff, I mean, fentanyl is a very potent drug. I, I don't know of this. I do know of some issues in the Southwest with fentanyl in terms of putting it in lollipops and all this stuff. So, you know, my job tonight is not to scare, um, it's to educate. Uh, I have three teenagers. I don't want to be a fear-based parent, um, but this is a real 
truthfully epidemic. So just as a way of introduction, I, I do thoracic surgery. Uh, I've been looking at lungs, physically looking at them for the last 27 years. Uh, I've been taking care of lung cancer patients during that time. That's probably the majority of my work. I thought that we were at a good place uh, societally and this epidemic has hit just in the last few years and I feel like my obligation is to prevent that next wave of, of problems. Uh, as a background, my undergraduate degree is in chemistry, so I think that comes into play here a little bit. If you give me just a sec, I just want to see if, is this a point? Oh, good. Um, so, <laughs> just from an educational standpoint, because I think that's really where we're going to make the big headway, I, I, this is going to be extremely difficult to legislate, to police. This has kind of slid under the regulatory aspect of things. I'll cover it a little bit. But, um, you know, the, the promise of e-cigarettes uh, was that we could help establish smokers back down. Uh, because I do know that nicotine is a, an addictive substance. I mean, I've dealt with my patients for years, and I know it's tough to quit. Uh, what I can tell you and what I have not before tonight said is that the physical aspects of a nicotine addiction really only last about 10 days. I do believe that our youth is a little bit more plastic, if you will, and hopefully that's the case. But if you can get past 10 days of nicotine, the physical addiction is gone, and then it's habitual. Because every smoker I've ever talked to, uh, first thing in the morning, it's a cup of coffee, it's the back deck, and a cigarette. So I tend to think of the lungs uh, as a tree. Uh, the, the body itself is a beautiful thing. The, the lungs are a beautiful thing. Air exchange in a tree occurs in the leaves. Uh, and for the tree, it's carbon dioxide into oxygen. The trunk of the tree uh, brings up stuff. I, that's the trachea. You just need to flip this upside down to see how I look at the lungs. But the air exchange occurs in the leaves of the tree. So th this is the tree. And I want to do a little bit of anatomy because I'm going to come back to it. But that's the trachea. This is the right and left main stem bronchi. And then you get further out into segmental bronchi and then bronchioles. And I want to have you remember that bronchiole uh, a little bit later when I come back to some of the aspects of uh, specifically with vaping. The little air sacs, the leaves of, of the tree, if you will, are the alveoli. Aeolus, the god of wind, uh, there are little tiny air sacs where there's a lot of surface area. And so for the tree, it's carbon dioxide into oxygen. For us, it's oxygen into carbon dioxide. That's really the only difference. So for me, this was a happy place in my career. And this kind of speaks to what you asked about why, you know, how is this happening? How can this happen? We knew that uh, cigarettes were a problem. And this big drop off, I guess the pointer's going to die, but uh, the drop off here, we began to see a drop off in the 90s for men because of the regulatory stuff that was put in place in the 70s. This is when people were smoking. When you're 20 years old and smoking, you don't get your lung cancer when you're 20, you get it when you're 55 or 60 or 70. But this was the, this is the 50s. Everybody was smoking. World War II. When I was in residency and fellowship, and I came out, I was taking care of the World War II vets who all smoked in the trenches, and everybody said, "Well, you know, they needed that." This is men. This is we call this literally the Virginia Slims bump, so that Virginia Slims heavily marketed to women as part of the women's movement back in the 70s suddenly it became okay for women to smoke. So their lag time to disease came later than men. But again, it fell off. And this is not because I do better surgery. It's not because we have better chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Those are all wonderful things. But that's because you don't see cigarettes in the movies anymore. You don't see them advertised on TV. 
we put in place societal regulations of, against this. And yet somehow we're back to um, advertising for e-cigarettes. Um, I, I saw an ad the other day, and I, I was talking to Marissa, I don't know whether it was on Netflix or whatever, I'm like, but this, this stuff is sliding under the regulatory path. So we did a good job. We, we actually made a difference. This was something that we did to ourselves. This is not purely environmental. We did that to ourselves, and yet we made a change in about the 70s, mid-70s, all of a sudden big warning labels, not good for pregnant women, get it out of the movies, get it out of the TV. Uh, but Juul is the new cool. So specifically, Marissa made a good point. Juul uh, is what the kids look at this. And it's one company and it's one type of e-cigarette, which is vaping, whatever you want to call it. Juul is the company that the kids know. Two thirds of Juuls end up in the hands of adolescents. It is, uh, they started, I don't know what made them particularly unique. The first ones I remember seeing were the blue cigarettes, um, and they're still out there, but Juul quickly ran away with it. They did a lot of social media marketing, as, as Marissa said. And that's not the flash drive, right? That is a Juul, and there's a charging station. Pretty much they all go on a USB port. When you smoke it and puff it, the little light lines up. Uh, but a lot of folks are like, what is that? And, you know, oh, it's a flash drive. No. So, <laughs> I actually, I have a confession when this started happening. I was like, oh, great, something to help my established smokers. And, and when it, I, I almost drank the Kool-Aid a little bit because there was a promise that this could help established smokers. Well, if that's the case, that's who we should be marketing it to, established smokers. But that's not where it went at all. But there was the promise that a small meter dose could give you that little nicotine fix. Yes, it's a lifelong addiction. Yes, you're really stuck with this. Can we help you? Is it better than smoking tar? OK, we're, it's a trade-off. So that was the promise. But it quickly changed into something else for kids. And it, they were targeted. It was marketed specifically to kids. The FDA raided the Juul offices, and they made a deal. They made, they've already made a deal, but it bought them time, and they've already established kind of a customer base. So what is it for kids? It's instant. It's easily concealed. The last talk I gave, I pulled one out. I could have puffed the thing. You know, there's a lot of vape goes right into your sweater. Um, it doesn't have a lingering cigarette kind of an odor. It's electronic, and I think that's important because the generation specifically for this has grown up with the iPhone, right? I'm going to get back to that generation a little bit. But electronic is big, uh, but it's easily concealed. I, Marissa and I were talking beforehand. Is this something that the schools can keep up with? I mean, you talk every school that I've talked to so far, I mean, it's a problem. And we, do they have sensors? Yeah. Are you going to be... Kids with technology, probably not, you know? And, and then what do you do, thank you, uh, what do you do when you, when you find somebody is a whole other thing? But the kids don't regard this as smoking. All, every, all the kids are raised, smoking is gross. Why would I smoke? Uh, no, I, I know smoking is gross. Uh, and 20% of kids uh, believe that it, it, you know, it's, it's not nicotine anyway. Um, so the FDA, Dr. Gottlieb, uh, did declare it an epidemic, and that's where we're at. So again, an epidemic, when it first starts, you don't know how big is it, how bad is it going to get. What do you do? How do you keep up with it? And, and, and Marissa is very correct. We have to do this locally. We have to do this like this. You have to talk to your friends, your other parents. You have to educate. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to keep up with it by our current uh, national governmental policy. Because we're not getting, I'm not going, sorry. So monitoring the future, you all heard of the Framingham study? We live in Massachusetts, right? The Framingham study was a very lifelong uh, cardiovascular disease in Framingham, Mass. 
Modern Reading of the Future is the University of Michigan uh, program that's been going on for 44 years now. So annually, they survey about 50,000 students uh, in many different schools. And they started 76. And they've been following school, high school students for 44 years. And you know, drugs, alcohol, behavioral issues. Uh, but basically, they also now are looking at e-cigarettes. And their estimate, based on the population studies, are that between 2017 and last year, so when you, when you compile statistics, this is like hot off the press, and yet we're a year behind on this thing, but it looks like we had 1.3 million new teenage smokers last year between 2017 and 2018, a million, 1.3 million teenagers embarked down this road. So there's not that many high school students anyway. I think the, it's 16 million in general, but this is an increase of a, a million people in our population in, in a year. So I, you know, I, I want to attack this from a science standpoint, but in order to do that, you have to understand what is this. It is a social phenomenon. These jewels are not one-offs. You don't find, in general, and I'm, I'm basing it talking to my kids and the kid, their friends and every kid I've met now, kind of like, hey, tell me what's going on. Nobody wants to out their friends. Nobody wants to, you know, get anybody in trouble. But this is a social phenomenon. These, these are shared. This is passed around. This is not, I have this, and I'm going to do this, and you're going to do yours. These, these are shared devices. Uh, the spinner came and went. If, if you saw this two years ago, it's gone. But the problem is nicotine's not, not gone. Uh, but it's a very social phenomenon. There's a status symbol with this. So, the, you know, off market, I think it's about 50 bucks you could get one. So it's an electronic device that gives you 50 bucks and status. So when you're a 10th grader, that's a big thing to have. And social media, Instagram, everybody's putting their puff out. Um, it is, that part of things is a very important aspect of understanding this. This is not one element of a school. This is all the kids, the students, the, the good students, the athletes. This seems to go across the boards. So there's no male, female gender differentiation on this. This is uh, a big, wide problem. And it, again, it's not Falmouth or Cape Cod, it's national. I, I have a current patient, her daughter flew out uh, for the operation. She's a newscaster from Texas, and uh, I, I guess I'm gonna be talking to her because she was already putting together, because she's seen this in uh, Lubbock, Texas, which I've been to Lubbock. There's not a lot going on out there, but there's jeweling going on. So, Marissa showed this, but again, on the chemistry background, I think there's a few aspects of this that are important. Uh, you're taking a serum, a, a, a liquid, and you're making that into a nebulized, aerosolized substance, or a vapor, if you will. But uh, again, Marissa is very good about it. It's not water vapor. But how do you get a maple syrup into a cloud? You have to superheat it. You have to add volatile stuff. It has to, you have a battery and then a coil to superheat it. And then you've got to add stuff to it. You've got to have the polypropylene glycol. You have to have the diacetyl. And again, with the number of different devices out there, they're switching it up all the time. Um, and the additives. So, the constant question, well, how do you know it's bad? I I'm sorry, but after staring at lunch for 27 years, after dealing with these products with a chemistry undergraduate degree, the lead time to disease is 20 years, and I am just not willing to wait until this current generation is 45 to say, see, I told you so. It's just not going to happen. We've done the basic work on it. So what do I know about disease currently? We have case reports of kids getting admitted with acute respiratory illness. 
I think that those are probably a separate cadre of kids. But they get admitted to the ICU, they get put on a breathing machine, why? Probably hypersensitivity. They probably had almost an allergic component to it. I have not met a school nurse yet in any of the school systems that I've been to who has not acknowledged that this is a problem. They're handing out cough drops like they've never had to hand out cough drops before. Kids are coming in nausea, vomiting, headaches. Uh, whether that's the nicotine over, you know, an acute dose of nicotine or withdrawal, but the, the kids are recognizing the kind of constant respiratory stuff. The delivery devices are all over the place, but again, they, they all have some electronic component to them. Uh, again, Marissa showed you this, the, the pods. Yes, a pack of nicotine per pod. Now, really, if we're trying to help established smokers quit smoking, do we need to sell mango, cherry, watermelon, cotton candy. And in one township on Cape, the focus right now is on menthol. Well, menthol suppresses a cough, and it's also flavored. And menthol cigarettes traditionally are not sold to oh, the over 40 crowd. They're, it's a young people's appeal. And so, yes, getting back to the question about THC and CBD, you can add this stuff. And there are flavors where you have not specifically with a jewel or a pod, but you can add an e-liquid that has THC, CBD, and nicotine. There are mixes, combos all across the board. It's so, that's the problem as a scientist background to take a variety of things and say, is this one bad? Well, this one doesn't have that substance. And I'll, I'll show you, there's a lot of different flavors. But it is important for me as a parent of three teens and under trying to understand this epidemic to understand what is this generation is. This generation, this is not the millennials. Uh, I'm watching new physicians come into the hospital and they're millennials and they have a certain thing where you know we believe we can understand them. This generation hasn't even been defined yet, but it is being defined a little bit by the recent school walkout, which for global warming by their response as a generation to the school shootings. But when you interview them and when you ask them in big sit down psychiatry kind of evaluations, unfortunately the school shooting thing weighs very heavily on, on this generation. Um, and it's forced them into a different position, but it's a very connected position. I think more than the millennials or prior generations, they feel for each other. But can you imagine growing up with a, you know, oh, buy Kevlar for your backpack, you'll be okay. Hide, hide in the, don't, no, don't move, no, no, you actually have to attack the shooter. Um, and, and they've grown up, you know, after 9-11, so the airport travel is not the same. They're under huge social media pressures, uh, Instagram, to look the part, be the part, be all that you can be, put it out there. Uh, and we're also saying, well, the truth is not the truth, because YouTube has a lot of it. If you try and figure this out on YouTube, you're going to see a lot of different opinions. There's one guy who's drinking a Mountain Dew telling me that it's not, you know, the science isn't there, et cetera. Also, it's important to note that this is a very stressed generation because of the aforementioned. Uh, traditional generations have reported about a 20% mental health issue problem. 40%, 37% of this generation says that they're under mental duress. Some would say that's not a bad thing because at least you're recognizing it uh, and, and, and reporting it. Uh, but clearly it's a stressed generation. And so for stress, I'm not gonna say that nicotine hasn't provided some soothing aspects. The problem is it's highly addictive. It's one of the five most highly addictive substances we have. When a rat is taught to get nicotine by pressing a lever, it will press the lever even at the cost of shocking itself to get the next hit of nicotine. And it is hard to quit. What else about this generation? The millennials are always getting beat up about not, they're very hard working actually. They're very, very caring about their friends. They get their information online. My, 
14-year-old built a computer over the summer purely from YouTube, not, not a piece of paper. And they do. They agree that smoking is gross. They're not going to smoke. And this is the signal that we've been sending to them as adults. This is our world right now. That's Tiger Woods winning the Open. I'm not a golf person, but I was fascinated. Talk about being in the moment. Like, if, if you didn't take a picture, you weren't there. So, so again, let's talk about the chemistry a little bit. The additives, the nicotine, I think we've said enough about that polypropylene glycol, diacetyl, the heavy metals, these things are carcinogens, okay? Polypropylene glycol, you can ingest, you can drink it. You may not hurt yourself too much, I wouldn't drink a lot of it. Diacetyl is specifically the popcorn lung. Now, I didn't really hear about popcorn lung on the thoracic surgery side. I, I know of the disease, and I'll go over that, but the popcorn actually comes from a microwavable popcorn company that was adding diacetyl to the popcorn for whatever made it pop better. Uh, and everybody started getting sick and said, oh, maybe we ought to get the diacetyl out of the microwavable popcorn bag. But look at the, all the additives. And, and how many did you say? There's like a, a gajillion flavors. There's, a, a gajillion. There's too many products to, to say this is the standardized dose. But that's the diacetyl and different flavors across the board. But what, what is popcorn lung? Well, the, the, the medical term is bronchiolitis obliterans. We like to throw out big words, uh, mostly so we can get paid more, I guess. But bronchiolitis obliterans, let's break it down. Bronchioles, I showed them to you. They're the little tiny tubes in the airway. Itis, tonsillitis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, inflammation. So, inflammation of the little tiny tubes in the airways obliterate, obliterate. So the little tiny tubes in the airways get inflammation. Inflammation means that if you twist your ankle, it swells. The, the capillaries open up. White blood cells go in to protect that area. And when that happens, the tubes close down and you, you obliterate the airway. So popcorn lung is bronchiolitis obliterans. It's a big fancy word, but it means you got swelling in the airways that no longer work. So that, I do a lot of lung cancer surgery, but occasionally the pulmonologist say, can you biopsy the lung for me? This is a CAT scan. We're looking from the bottom up. This is reasonable lung. It's not great lung here, because there's patches through it. This is a middle lobe where there's inflammation. So where is the air exchange in the, in the leaves of this tree happening? In the darker areas, but you get patchy inflammation through your lungs. And again, my problem is, you know, like, I'm not talking to kids about cancer risk from this stuff because I don't think most teenagers want to look 20 years ahead, but that's what we're dealing with. I don't, I haven't operated on a 25 year old for a smoking induced lung cancer, okay? But 38, yes. 45, oh yeah. 55, oh yeah. My, my, you know, when I see patients that are 55 to 85, I don't see 25 year olds with it, but when did they smoke? When they were 25, when they were, 15. Uh, so it's a lead time issue. So we can wait. We can wait on this if we want. We'll find out how bad it's going to get. So similar slide Marissa put up. I, this is Florida, okay, but it, it's a little bit more telling because, again, traditional tobacco products sales have gone way down over the past several years, 2000. This purple is the epidemic. And we really didn't see this stuff begin to even register for the last four years. But that's what's happened at these cigarettes. And that's just 2015. We're up here now. So, Jewel, San Francisco, a bunch of hipsters, probably. But it's $45 billion company. Uh, they own two-thirds of the e-cigarette market. Some of the friends of my kids' friends said, well, you know, they can't buy this stuff. 
And with, when the kids were there, I'm like, buy it. And they they go online. You got your Amazon card. You, you just click a box. Am I 18? Am I 21? You can get it online. You can get it from other kids. There's kids who don't jewel or sell it in the uh, schools. This is the kind of cost, but it's about, I think it's five bucks or so for a pot. Um, we're, we're taping this and I'm gonna hold because I promised that there's a bad word. South Park does a nice job of showing how um, there is an aftermarket in the schools, but I, I'm probably gonna pause on this one um, and take the next slide. The estimates in the economist and the, and the, the financial world is that e-cigarettes worldwide are gonna sell more than traditional tobacco products by 2021. In other words, tobacco sales are done. E-cigarettes are gonna pass traditional tobacco by 2021. And that's easily verified, Forbes magazine. There's big money in this stuff. Uh, here's one link. So <clears throat> the parent company of Marlboro, which is the cigarette of the generation before, well, they were Lucky Strikes, but then my generation was Marlboro, Parliament. The parent company of that, Philip Morris, is owned by Altria. They just bought $13 billion worth of jewel. That's the first CEO. So this is not a couple of hipsters in Brooklyn putting these things together. Uh, this is a big company out to make big money. Now, back to the question of additives. So Altria, who owns Philip Morris, also bought $2 billion worth of a cannabis company. So the delivery device is there, and it's going to be an easy jump. This is worldwide sales. That's in the millions, okay? So that's not 10,000, that's add another zero, zero, zero. 10 billion dollars, just skyrocketing worldwide. Not, not a problem for Falmouth, this is a worldwide problem. That's the Republican, traditionally conservative, <coughs> Speaker of the House who left to take a job for the American Cannabis Summit. Uh, Personal beliefs aside, I don't know where he stands on that, but this is big lobbying. The American Vaping Association is already in the Capitol building quite heavily saying, oh, we'll make a deal. Let's make a deal. We'll withdraw the advertising from social media on watermelon and cotton candy, et cetera. We, we will not market specifically to kids anymore. Please don't. Finance. Well, the person who was going to bring the fines down was Dr. Gottlieb, who has unfortunately resigned. I would say if you want to read one good article, and it's easy to kind of remember, just Google The Promise of Vaping and the Rise of Jewel. This is actually an older article, but extremely well written. Kind of covers the history, the social aspect of this thing. Uh, it's a very good article. Uh, gives you a broader view of where we are and where we're headed. For kids, again, I, I don't focus on the 20-year cancer risk. I think as a parent, you have to acknowledge that this is a phenomenon that exists, that it's every kid out there is under some pressure or motivation, but I do think that they don't want to see their friends get hurt by this. I don't think they want to see their friends have problems with it. I've shown respiratory stuff to my kids, and it, you know, it's science, and I don't know. They're, but I don't think they want to be played by big tobacco, but they're being played by big tobacco. And the nicotine aspect of this, the addiction of nicotine, is not to be messed with. So those are the things that I think you have to do. I think all I can do right now is say, this is more important to me. I can spend a few hours with one lung patient, or I can spend my time trying to prevent more lung patients in the future. Um, but you know, education is where we're going to come out. We're not going to keep up with the regulation on a national basis. But on the local basis, can you say, yeah, maybe we don't need this in our, in our uh, convenience stores all the time. 
raise the rate. I think Massachusetts is doing a pretty good job, um, you know, in, in terms of what it does. But the, the cat's out of the bag a little bit on this. Um, so education will do. Is nicotine something that you can withdraw from and can lift? Yes, absolutely. Um, but I, uh, again, I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just trying to educate. So that's that's it on my side. Um, we can go back to questions. Thank you, guys, for coming. Yes. I had a question. Sure. I, I have to say, from a, I, I, I'm her biggest fan because. She's been extremely proactive about this topic, and I, I, I know how hard it must be to kind of keep up with this, because when I talk to the teachers, it's like, you know, you, you can do it in the classroom and, and hold it and seal it. That's what I was just gonna talk about, actually. I have four children, and my oldest is a freshman, and he's Yeah, again, I'm not sure. I, I don't know of any specific like, support groups. 
Again, the chemistry that I do know is that the, the physical aspect of the nicotine addiction, and it does rewire you a little bit, but that physical aspect is there for about 10 days. So if you can make it over a 10 day hump, then, then you're in a better place. And it, you know, I do think that probably kids are a little bit more plastic and a little bit more reprogrammable that way. There aren't specifically though established stop smoking programs for kids. We, we do a reasonable job for adults, and yet even those programs are not 100% successful. One of the most disconcerting things from my perspective as a high school principal is this entire industry is geared towards being sneaky and deceptive. Um, so I was just telling Dr. Spillane, I recently came across, there is a new vape pen that looks like an asthma inhaler. And the marketing is, hey, trick your uh, parents and teachers into thinking you're puffing, taking a puff from your asthma inhaler. There's another one that looks, it's the Soren brand that looks like a credit card. So it can be slipped in and out of a wallet very easily. Um, so the whole marketing campaign is based on being very, very deceptive and easily hidden. So we do know what to look for. It's just sometimes you can't even see it because it's, it's just almost invisible. Um, one other point that, about the chemicals, there's also things called dab pens that are THC vape pens. And I actually have um, know someone off Cape whose son was just diagnosed with pesticide poisoning from dab pen use because of the chemicals, the pesticides that are in the dab pens. So I found this very beneficial uh, and learned a lot. And I'm just curious when you when you're doing these kind of presentations or whatever you're doing in the health classes, are they hearing like? to hear from a, a doctor or a thoracic surgeon and, a, and Marissa from what you've had to say. I mean, if you, if you brought these, like if the kids, if the students were here listening to these two folks um, talk about this, would that have a bigger impact than just like a worksheet? Or, you know what I mean? Yeah, I thought about doing presentations for the whole school. Yeah. So, um, good. We could. I, I, applaud, we I, applaud, I do applaud the parents that brought your children here yeah. tonight. I think that's incredible. Um, and I'm sorry that more didn't because this is what the students really need um, to hear. I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I, um, I, is this going to be, well, no, it's going to be taped. So it'll be online? Probably put on Facebook. Tape my PowerPoints online. I, you know, I have to be frank about this. this you know, when they talk about callings, I, I don't mean to feel like there's a higher purpose and stuff, but I'm stumbling through this. I, I know, I mean, this is like, we have to understand it before I can preach about it. I'm happy to talk to kids in any way. I've made myself available to as many school systems and as many nights or days to talk to whoever about this. But this is something that caught everybody off guard. I mean, it, it literally is an epidemic. And I think two years ago, we knew about this. I've met sixth graders. The, the bathroom aspect, I've heard from kids, the, the pressure a little bit, you know, oh, it's uncomfortable. And again, it's not found, it's not just get caught, but every place I've talked to, this has gone like that. And it is because we're all so interconnected now that it became this thing almost overnight. And the teachers have had to recognize, what do we do about this? The administrators have got to figure out, do we, do we educate or, or penalize? But I'm, I'm available on this, you know? But honestly, I didn't, I didn't think, I, two years ago, I didn't think I'd be here at all. You know, I thought, I thought my work was over that hump, you know? <laughs> uh, to, to answer the question, to add, um, you know, I just said that some of them think um, there are some uh, lessons that are for assemblies, so we can look further into that. Well, why not just have a have this for the kids? So my grant funding is through the Department of Public Health, and I can't speak to students um, just because of the, the grant funding. 
restrictions um, on the grant. Yeah, the restrictions. But there, there is someone who is funded uh, on a grant through CVS Health, actually, and she works at Health Resources in Action. And I just shared that I can share her contact info. Um, and she, she can do two things. One is she can help schools implement the first lesson of the Catch My Breath curriculum, but you're already doing that. Um, and the second thing that she can do is an assembly style presentation um, for kids. So look in their bedrooms, look through their things. It's really, it's not, it's a community issue, um, home and school. We try our best here, but you know, we, we can't search students the way you can search them at home, so. Yes. I'm interested in your comment that kids can access cancer, because they're certainly familiar with death, with school shootings and knowing kids that have died under tragic circumstances. And in fact, if you think about analogous situation, people who are in recovery from drug addiction come in and share their story and talk to kids to try to motivate it. Now, it's a little darker to bring in someone with a terminal cancer diagnosis. I mean, my parenting was done 30 or 40 years ago, so maybe this isn't consistent with modern practice, but um, how do you mean that kids can't access the idea of cancer in a 20 year timeline? I, I just think, you know, I'm going back to what my dad told me, you're, you're not looking that far ahead. <laughs> he was right, I mean, I really wasn't. And that, I, I don't know, I, I don't have enough child psychology background to understand what kids seem to be a little bit more in the immediate thing. They're, there's no doubt, though, and it's a very good analogy, that the addiction stuff and the recovery stuff seems to resonate with kids because I've, I've known that's impactful to kids. You know, the, there's a Celtic, former Celtics player who goes around, preaches mindfulness, and he's recovering. I think the kids know that because he's an athlete. And so maybe you're right. I mean, maybe I do have to explore that on their own. But. Well, if you brought in someone with popcorn love, I think, you know, everyone has a level of vanity that they respond to. The funny thing was about five years ago, we did something through Falmouth Hospital, and I, I remember going to a thing, and I had a, a pig lung, that uh, they unfortunately forced the pig to smoke before they were blowing it up, and the kids were fascinated with the damage to the pig lung. So I hope I don't have to get to that point again. <laughs> Maybe. So I want to thank Dr. Splain and um, Marissa for coming here and, and sharing. Um, just want to remind you that um, we have the table here with some of the devices and, and I know Marissa will be happy to, to talk with you with them and see that. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us um, continuously. We will thank you for some of your uh, ideas tonight. Uh, we will continue to um, you know do things. We'll look into the assembly. We'll look into um, possibly bringing someone into the health classes in a smaller group, uh, and um, we'll, we'll see what we can do for support. Um, this is an epidemic, as both of them have said, and it's something that, that's uh, very important for us to, to try to educate and help students. So thank you for your interest, and thank you for being here tonight.